What's up, YouTube? It's William Cho here, back with another Pick'ems video, this time for VCT Pacific Stage 1. It seems like it was only two, maybe three months ago that we were all fiending for more VCT content. We were all reminiscing about past matches because there was nothing else to watch. And now we're doing Pick'ems videos every week, it feels like. So, you know, maybe, maybe uh, some things could change there for the future. But anyways, we won't beat the dead horse anymore. Obviously, looking forward, stage one is about to kick off this coming weekend. And, I mean, VCT Pacific is kind of in the spotlight right now, thanks to Gen G's performance, and I would say Paper X as well, at Masters Madrid. What we're going to do today is we'll take a look at all the Week 1 matches, and as we're going through them, we'll discuss what we expect from each of these teams going into Stage 1. Now that we've had a glimpse of all of them during kickoff, obviously, some of the teams... Not as much, like poor old ROQ. But nonetheless, we'll talk about what we think is going to happen, what we can look forward to, what we should be looking for uh, for each of these teams. And after we go through the week one matches, we will be reviewing what my preseason tier list was of all the teams and see how things might have changed after kickoff and Masters Madrid. Let's jump right into it. Before we go into the schedule for all the matches one by one, we'll just take a quick look at the overall group. So we got Alpha, which includes Gen.G, Global Esports, T1, Team Secret, and Bleed. Meanwhile, Omega has DFM, DRX, PaperX, RQ, Talon, and Zeta. These two just can't ever get away from each other. Uh, but overall, I, I do think these groups are actually surprisingly quite even. Uh, now, we should note for Stage 1, it's these groups playing each other, right? So, for instance, Gen G is not going to play GE for Stage 1. That will happen in Stage 2. So, it's going to be the record of Gen G versus all of the teams in Omega, and then compare that to GE versus all of the teams in Omega, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. So, just keep that in mind as you're looking forward to Stage 1, because obviously this is a new format, and it can seem a little bit confusing since we're all new to it, and you're probably not staring at it nonstop. But so just so you know, the storylines like Gen G versus T1 or DRX versus PaperX, that's not going to happen until stage two, which could have some implications because some of these teams definitely need a little bit more time to cook. Overall, I would say based on what we've seen from kickoff, the reason I say it seems pretty even is, I mean, for instance, Gen G, you know, a meteoric rise for them for sure, taking second place, first ever grand final for Korea uh, at a Masters event. Uh, T1 looked still pretty promising in my opinion. Team Secret, I mean, they had a rough debut of 2024, but I think they've really picked things up going into play-ins. Granted, they didn't make it to playoffs, uh, but I really think they continue to prove that they're still going to be that contender for play playoffs and kind of a higher seeding trying to get into a Masters or a Champions. Meanwhile, GE and Bleed, I mean, there's definitely some stuff to review there. Meanwhile, in Omega, I mean, you've got Paper Rex who, despite having some trouble figuring out what they don't, what they want to do with their roster and their comps, uh, still got third place at Masters Madrid, still was able to overpower most of uh, the teams that they faced here, which actually, now that I think about it, was really only Gen G and T1. But both of those teams looked good, so I think that's a good standing for Paper Rex. Uh, I would say Talon actually came out swinging. Uh, DRX definitely has fallen compared to the past in terms of like what their ranking should be and what uh, the expected results are for are for them. But obviously their roster is still very solid. Uh, then you've got I think RRQ who listen still put up a fight against Gen G. Uh, we'll get to the details of my thoughts on RQ here in a little bit. Uh, and then you have DFM and Zeta, who uh, both seem to have still a bit of an identity crisis, right? I mean, DFM, a decent first showing, and then looked really rough as they were last year. And Zeta, kind of the same thing, right? Started to look a little, little, little hopeful, and then just dropped off. So overall, power level, I think on average, kind of matches up, and it'll be interesting to see which teams grow as the year goes on. Let's jump right into the schedule. Week 1 of ECT Pacific will be kicking off on April 6th, this coming Saturday. And matches will be going on from Saturday through Tuesday for most of the weeks this year, I believe. So uh, if it's ever the weekend through Tuesday, you can assume VCT Pacific is going on. What we're going to do today is we will go through for week 1 of the matches. We'll kind of talk a little bit more in depth about each team, kind of what I'm expecting, what we saw from kickoff, and then we'll do our pickems. And then just for fun, we will go through the rest of the week's pickems as well, but then... After each week, we'll go back and review them and change anything we want based on what we saw from the previous weeks as the season continues on. 
So that's just something to look forward to. Kicking things off in the very first day, the very first weekend this Saturday is going to be Global Esports versus Zeta Division and Team Secret versus DRX. Now, this is actually, uh, it's quite an interesting day of matches, in my opinion. So here's the thing. We'll start with GE and Zeta Division. GE and Zeta Division have already faced each other two times this year. This will already be their third matchup, okay, in 2024 alone. So they faced each other in the opening match of kickoff in Group A, and then they met each other in Decider, where Zeta Division was able to take down GE once again to move into the play-ins, and now they'll be kicking things off in Stage 1 against each other as well. So there's that, right? It's already a bit of a it's already a bit of a weird rivalry going on here between GE and Zeta. When looking at these two teams, though, they're oddly both teams that didn't exactly showcase the potential that they had. Well, I say oddly because here's the thing: it's neither neither of these teams were expected to be like heavy hitters at the beginning of 2024. Right? We're not talking like grand old potential all the way down the line, things like that. We're just saying, what did people expect coming into the year 2024? I think there was a little bit of a wider spread of opinions on Zeta Division just because of their history and obviously star players like Deb, etc. Uh, but then when it comes to GE, like everyone agreed, okay, you've got a roster full of veterans. Most of these guys all have a lot of experience either, you know, calling or clearly assisting in calls and preps based on what their teammates have said before, you know, their, their attitude on stage. They've been on various stages around the world. And so there was some expectation that, oh, they should still be pretty stable, uh, but coming in to kickoff, so let's talk GE first. GE didn't exactly showcase to us that they were going to be the team that brings new ideas in a creative and solid way. Now, they still could be that team, but here's what I mean. Everyone likes to talk about their bind, right? Their solo Viper bind. And everyone likes to talk about how bad they think the comp is. Now, I agree. I don't like the comp, but... The issue I saw, even more so than the composition, was that they weren't even able to show us why they picked the comp in the first place. And if you look at actually some of the GE videos they've released, they released one um, that kind of reviews what happened at kickoff. Uh, it's 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 kind of an actually interesting vlog style where it's mostly just kind of these interviews with different members of the team. But they say it seems and maybe i'm maybe i'm mistaking this but it seems that they believe that the execution was a bigger issue than the composition on by now regardless of whether you objectively think that's true or not i can see where they're coming from because again i said this when we were on cast as well whether it's on my streams etc every time i've gotten a chance to talk about it the problem i saw more so than the composition itself is it can be a bad comp but at least i want to see why you picked it Right, because otherwise the comp I always go back to on my when we're doing co streams for various regions is I don't want it to become the Jet Arena Icebox. And what I mean by the Jet Arena Icebox is to this day I haven't really heard a team confidently tell me after even if they get a win right after getting the win on Icebox if they're using Jet Arena and then like Sova Viper Killjoy or whatever. I've, I haven't really heard any team come out and say in the winner's interview of, oh yeah, we really tried this and uh, the way that you're able to use the Leer and you chain these things together and the space that Reyna creates, that really works for us in Icebox. No, generally what I hear from teams, even if they win with that comp is, well, we couldn't make the other compositions work. So we went back to this. And listen, I mean, Reyna can do some cool things on Icebox. I think Reyna as an individual can suit various parts of Icebox. Well, obviously mainly a pipe, things like that. But I'm not seeing, for instance, it's very different from like a, a Reyna, Ray's Sky Harbor, right? Where the chaining of all the different things alongside the Leer. So either the Leer is set up to succeed or the Leer is setting someone else up to succeed one way or the other, right? Like I'm not seeing this flow chart of the path to success. It's more so just oh, okay, well, if I hit my shots, like, it's cool. Like, there's there's things that can work. And it's also very, it's just in that one scenario, right? It's like, okay, well, if the Reyna does well, that's great. But if they don't, then I'm basically looking at a composition with only four agents. Uh, and I'm not saying that GE was basically a composition with four agents. I'm just making this comparison of, I wanted to see, okay, what is it that you want to do? It could succeed, it could fail. But at least I want to see the process. Uh, and I want to see you attempting things that I can... 
uh, tangibly, you know, feel from the gameplay. And we just didn't see much of that. Again, you know, just like just like the Reina comps on Icebox, just like the Jet Reina on Icebox, there were moments, right, where the agents were doing some neat things. And, you know, there were some mini tactics that were working out, some, you know, small set plays, micro plays, things like that, where it's like, oh, like the chaining of that is cool. Okay, yeah, that's all great, but... Like, how are you getting there? Like, how is your team setting yourself up for success? And we just didn't see much of that. And quite frankly, I I was hoping that regardless of the actual numbers, that we would actually get a lot of that from GE, right? Whether they're putting up round wins or not. I, I was hoping that was the color that GE was going to show us in 2024. And so far, I'm not convinced. Now, it does sound like, right, they agree that whatever they've been practicing and, and scrims, et cetera, didn't come out on stage, for kickoff so can they identify the weaknesses to make sure that they showcase what they've been preparing well i would hope so i would hope so now on the flip side zeta division okay they make some much needed changes everyone's been saying zeta is also one of those teams that probably needs a change regardless just because you're getting you know you're, you're getting a little complacent right you're just trying to make old things work in new metas against new competition etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so they make these new uh, changes. They bring in two new recruits. And quite frankly, I think both of them did quite well. Euron more than Huron, actually. I was actually expecting a lot more from Huron from the off-season form that both of them showed. But Euron actually came out with a lot more, I think, firepower and a lot more moments than Huron did. But overall, people were expecting, okay, you've got like revamped firepower. You've got these young guns who are probably or hopefully going to be much more eager to make things happen. They're going to bring in fresh ideas, etc. And then you've got Carlo coming in, which no one saw coming. But at the end of the day, it's another outside POV that should help shake things up for Zeta Division. Now, their opening match against GE, as messy as that match was, I thought we saw Zeta taking a lot more initiative, right? Uh, and again, for better or worse. And to me, whether it was for better or for worse, that was a good sign for a Zeta division that used to play very, very slow and very, very stale. Uh, so initially I was like, okay, the match is messy, etc. But if the, like this is the path I would want to see Zeta division continue on. And then as kickoff went on and you know they played even through the play-ins, it just seemed like they were like losing a lot of confidence and then that was breaking up their comms and then they were going back to playing slower and reactive. Uh, and it was hard to shake off old habits. So, again, these are two teams that basically, they didn't even perform up to, like, the direction that I was hoping to see from them uh, in kickoff. Now, what I will say, and I'll give this edge to Zeta Division, is Zeta Division played a significant uh, extra number of rounds compared to GE because Zeta Division got to play two extra matches in the play-ins. We've heard this from like Gen G, you know, after their win at kickoff, they talked about how the pure number of rounds, because they played something like 429 rounds or something, just way miles above anybody else in, in kickoff for Pacific. And they talk about how just the sheer number of rounds they had, they had to grind out probably gave them an uh, advantage, gave them an advantage against opponents like DRX, where they were able to just identify their weaknesses a lot more and work on it and fix it and improve it and iterate on it from game to game to game, as tiring as it was. Now, we heard Sentinel say something similar as well. One of the reasons that you know Coach Kaplan and some of their players point to in how they were able to beat Gen G in the grand finals was perhaps losing to Gen G the first time, right? And then going through so many more matches, so many more rounds. I mean, Sentinels also had to go through play-ins at America's kickoff. And as tiring, as grueling as it was, they talk about how that not only makes them better, right, by identifying some of the weaknesses, but also puts them kind of in this position to really up their mental game as well, things like that. So I think Zeta having more tape of their own to go back to and review and work on should come in as an advantage. GE, on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, I should say, GE, I mean, even in their vlog, right, they're talking about, well, it, it was really good in scrims, things like that. So, yes, you did still play three matches. It wasn't just a two and done uh, and get eliminated. So you did play three matches. But overall, it's, it's not that much, right? Because two of those matches were against Zeta Division, and Bind was played on both of those. So you don't have a wide breadth of opinions to gather from and VODs to review on your own. So most likely, you're probably still just working on the things you've been working on. Uh, so again, this is not against GE. I just think this is tough for any team. If you don't have as much 
firsthand experience to go back and work on and iterate on, I think it's a lot harder because you have to basically try to imagine what else you should work on. And that's tough. That, that's tough for any team or any coaching staff or any players. So I just think Zeta has a slight edge there. I also think in terms of just like pure firepower and, and mechanics. And when we say firepower mechanics, I don't just mean like aim lab scores and things like that, but also just how much more fluid are the individuals able to be? I want to give a slight edge to Zeta. The only edge I'm really giving to G is again, like they have a lot of experience. So, you know, going through the long matches on stage, etc. Obviously, they have a lot of experience, but quite frankly, Zeta is not exactly lacking in that either because the core three that remain from Depp, Laz, and Sugar Zero, I almost said Sugar Hero, but Sugar Zero, have all been around for so long as well. So at the end of the day, I'm going to give a slight edge to Zeta Division. Now, Team Secret versus DRX. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack here. So uh, Secret versus DRX. First of all, Secret was one of the teams that actually took down DRX last year. They took them down, gave them that loss in the round robin for league play of VCT Pacific 2023. Uh, they did match up against each other in the playoffs again, and DRX was able to beat them that time. But it was a bit of a shocker, right? And Secret it has historically been known as these giant killers. Now, the flip side of that coin is Secret also tends to lose games against teams they shouldn't. So really, Secret seems to be this team that always plays to the level, like up or down to the level of their opponents. We'll get back to that in a second. Meanwhile, DRX, um, I mean, I think they looked maybe mildly worse than some people expected. I We all expected some sort of shakeup, right? Uh, with, with the roster change, it's a pretty big one with both Zest and RB being removed, Foxy and Flashback, Foxy9 and Flashback being put into the main roster. And then the roles for Foxy9 were a big question. And, you know, he, did, he was serviceable, I think. I think he did pretty good on the Viper. But aside from that... Uh, you know, some of the other initiators, etc. still didn't look that convincing. Uh, Flashback had some great highlights, like his individual mechanics, you know, his, his aim and his movement seem really good, uh, but maybe not as in tune with the pace, etc. So DRX still in a bit of a shaky spot. However, things just got crazier because they just recently added Bane into the main roster. They announced another roster change where, where they're adding everyone's favorite component of a Valorant roster, which is the sixth man onto a five-man team. Now, some background on Bane. If you don't know, Bane is the OG trainee for DRX back when they were Vision Strikers. This guy was with the OG core of Vision Strikers uh, all throughout their career. He was tagging along. He was at the stadiums, right, watching their matches from behind the scenes. He was always watching the scrims. They they always used to kind of talk about how they're really trying to build him up into this great player. They even kept him on contract and gave him out to on loan to other teams in Challengers Korea. Uh, to like play in the qualifiers and things like that. Uh, and then eventually he was released and actually joined a couple of the teams in Korea in Challengers. And then he even played briefly in China at the end of last year. Like Bane has been around, right? Basically what's been happening is, is like DRX was going out on raids and Bane couldn't join the raid group, but every time he'd be looking, he'd be watching his teammates stream the raid. He'd be learning about all the timings and then he'd just go out into the field and just farm all these mobs as much as he could. And so Sometimes he'd go into like a higher level area and he would get bodied and then he'd go back and he'd just farm more mobs and he's just hoarding whatever experience he can get out on the field, but he just hasn't really had the chance to get into the DRX raid group. Well, now he's given that chance three years after the fact that he was first a trainee uh, back in the Vision Strikers days. But the real question is, is, is he playing, right? And I mean, there's... I, I almost hate to say this out loud, but there's no way DRX is adding Bane just to put him on the bench again. Like, I don't think Bane should take that offer, and I don't think DRX should make that offer. I, I mean, just for optics, let alone anything else. So, surely, surely he's not just sitting on the bench, which means he's replacing somebody somewhere. Now, originally, when people were asking... I, I used to say, okay, I mean, if I had to make a guess, I, I guess he's replacing Foxy9. I guess. Does that really make things better? I mean, maybe. So a lot of people are focusing on the fact that Bane is first and foremost a duelist player, but then again, so was everybody on DRX. The next thing he's played a lot of, especially when he was kind of bouncing around Challengers Korea, was uh, the Sova and the Info Initiator. 
And the more I thought about this, as I was getting ready to record this video, I actually think the the most logical chance of what DRX is going to do is they're going to play everyone's favorite childhood game, Musical Chairs. Now, I know, I know there's a couple of you out there that are that are molding in your seats right now, but I actually think this is a very likely scenario. I think there's a chance that if they're continuing to want to play the Viper double controller on some of the maps, which currently still seems to be kind of the go-to way to play a lot of the maps in the map pool, uh, you're still gonna allow Foxy9 to be that Viper, right? And have Mako play the other controller. And that way you can play the double controller. Because I think Foxy9 looks, looks fine on the Viper. But then if you were to go into anything else, right? Whether you want to play double flash or you want to play double initiator. So like info and flash initiator, things like that. I think that's where Bane starts to come in to the question. He's played a lot of Sova still. I mean, sure, Jet is, Jet is his absolutely most played agent so far, but he's been bouncing around and he's played quite a few different agents, obviously most of them on a small scale, but Sova, a decent amount. And I remember him going to some Challengers Korea teams and starting to play the Sova. And I was like, wow, really? You're willing to give up the duelist spot just to continue playing and try to make something work as a team? Uh, but apparently he was committed to do so. And quite frankly, Stax, while he's great on a lot of different agents, his main deal is Flash, right? His main deal is Flash Initiators. I mean, for goodness sake, back in the day, he was the one playing Phoenix for this team whenever they wanted to. He's like Sadak. He just wants to play with more Flash Initiators, more Flash Agents in Valorant. Uh, that's what he's good at. Now, yes, he's played a lot of Fade as well, especially back when they were playing Triple Initiator, and that's where that comes from. But aside from that, I mean, his Sova it didn't exactly look very convincing. I mean, it was serviceable, but if you end up having like two, two, three guys that are serviceable, it's going to be really hard for you to become the top team or the top two, three team in a VCT region. So that's something to consider. On top of that, Foxy9 still was pretty up and down. I mean, he showed you know, a, a good handful of agents at kickoff, but, and I would say it was better than a lot of people were afraid it was going to be, but perhaps not consistent enough. So I'm imagining like Bane can also help play the double duelist. He can help play double initiator. I think he adds in a lot more of this flexibility, but again, I think it comes at the cost of potential musical chairs. So just keep that in your mind. So let's go back to the actual matchup. So in my opinion, I think Team Secret, while they had a rough debut against Talon Esports in their opening match, they woke up afterwards and they were firing on all cylinders. I mean, Jeremy topped the boards overall in terms of just like overall stats and rating uh, for kickoff in Pacific overall. I think Jeremy was maybe like tied alongside Texture for first kills per round. Uh, he might have been like, he, I, he definitely had the most ACS. He might have also been tied for overall kills per round or something like that or right around the top three something like that so jeremy was starting to really put up numbers which i thought secret either becoming a great team or another like gatekeeper team right the litmus test team the difference was going to be jeremy in my opinion because i think ndg was going to be a, a solid stable upgrade i would say slight upgrade uh, in terms of giving the stability to the roster and also just having the mechanics to really be this good lurker and anchor as a sentinel so then the question is, can Jeremy become the reliable, explosive duelist? And I think he started to show that after the matchup against Talon Esports. He woke up and he was getting in there. He was putting up numbers. Envy, once again, putting up numbers. So if you can rely on those two to continue to put up that performance, I think Team Secret is going to end up coming back and basically proving doubters wrong once again in 2024 uh, so i'm not going to make the mistake i did in 2023 while secret is a very prep heavy team i think drx is still going to be trying to figure their own play out a, a little bit uh, so i'm going to give secret the edge in this match i also just want to add one more thing for drx mako was actually uh, his numbers weren't that bad but he was actually making a lot more like small micro mistakes compared to the past so basically he wasn't like carrying and clutching as much, uh, and he wasn't being as reliable. And while this is just speculation, I wonder if it's because DRX was trying to get into a much more fluid play style, not relying on just set plays, right? Not relying on a very strict flow chart, but trying to really be much more adaptive as the match goes on, like mid rounding, things like that. Cause it did seem like there were times where, where Maka was having trouble, like catching up to himself basically. 
So I'm not just talking about the lockdown mistake, but overall, whether it's his like movement in like a 1v1 or a 1v2, like his his kind of choices that you could see and whether he was going to put up a smoke or not, things like that. It just didn't seem as stable as in the past. So I do wonder if that's a stylistic thing. I mean, that's just speculation because here's the thing. I mean, I think surely Mako is a great enough player that he'll get used to it if he has to. I think at kickoff, though, it just looked a little shaky. But with all that considered, and specifically, again, us having no idea exactly what's going to happen to the DRX main roster, because, I mean, goodness me, surely not. Surely Bane isn't replacing, like, Buzz or Mako or Stacks. although I think... The next likely scenario is like maybe he replaces Sax, but Sax is the leader and the captain and the face of DRX Valorant. So I can't imagine that that's going to happen. But I think Secret is in a prime position to take advantage of DRX still trying to work things out with their roster and they can get that first win against DRX. Moving forward, Bleed versus Talon Esports. This is a fun match to talk about because in my head, these two teams should have been, they were, or not should have been, they were in reverse positions before kickoff. So basically what I mean is before kickoff, I would look at talent and I would think, man, like, sure, the individuals seem great, but how are you going to make this roster work? Like, what's the game plan here? I'm just not seeing it. There's question marks all over the place. That was my impression of them. And then bleed, I was like, okay, like, I, I kind of see it. I, I see what you're trying to cook. I'm kind of excited for it. Now it's reversed, right? Bleed, we're looking at the roster and I'm like, dude, what is going on here? I mean, the, again, the individuals are all great, very hopeful, but does it come together? Whereas Talon, I'm like, ooh, okay, okay, you're cooking, you're cooking. It's not done yet, it's not finished yet, but but I'm seeing it, right? I'm, I'm seeing the ingredients, I see what the plan is, right? I, I wanna see what the finished product is now like. So let's talk about Bleed first, since they're at the top here in the bracket. Uh, obviously, if you've been living under the rock, what did happen was that they made some huge roster changes. So Crazy Guy, their old IGL, is now inactive on the bench. Uh, and then Egoist was also benched, but then he basically retired and quit Valorant Esports. So they then brought in Zest of old DRX and Retla, one of their old players as well. Again, the individuals are fine. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the individuals. But the question is, is does it come together? Like who's calling? It seems the idea is scary is now gonna call, which how does that impact his own performance is the big question. And then Zest, as far as I know, doesn't have like great English. I mean, sure, like you'll you'll be able to like get through the game. Obviously, like a lot of the Korean players play on the Asia servers a lot as well, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, Zest has been abroad at all the international terms before with DRX. Like he'll be able to communicate somewhat, but it, in a game of Valorant, you got to be very snappy. And we see this language bar barrier a lot with a lot of the teams here in Pacific. And Bleed was already a team where most of the, you know, a, a big chunk of the team, English wasn't their first language. So I have no idea how this is going to work. The good news for Zest fans is it was very clear that Zest was hungry to get back into the top tier of competition. He was briefly playing for Team I Am and Challengers Korea, which is one of the new like streamer teams. Uh, and he joined that squad and their captain, Duenmo, the guy who made that team and project, uh, talked a little bit about what that process was like because Zest apparently had some other offers prior, but they basically convinced him to stay because he was helping them so much. He was helping them grow so much and they were already prepping for qualifiers. But then an offer he couldn't refuse came up and they also kind of saw that, okay, this guy really wants to get back and, and grow within the best of the best. We don't want to hold him back. So they parted ways amicably. So now Zest is back. So the good news is, is clearly he's hungry for that competition. He's here to continue to work on his craft. That's great. And Zest seems to be a very smart player, but can he fit in to the system of bleed, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, especially not in this short amount of time. Uh, and then, I mean, Retla, I think is, is fine, right? I, I don't think that, I don't think there's anything too like great or terrible to talk about here in terms of Retla uh, coming in for Egoist. So overall the roster like people always ask well is this an upgrade i'm like i have no idea i mean i guess individually speaking i guess zest is an upgrade than crazy guy sure actually for sure right just because of flexibility etc and also the experience he's shown through and through but i mean does that is it gonna work though right in the team is the big question uh so i'm not quite sure while we're on the topic of bleed 
Uh, everyone likes to talk about Ye on Viper. Everyone's like, everyone used to say, oh, why are you making him play lineups? I actually am one of the people that I think Ye on Viper makes a lot of sense. Like Viper is not just about the lineups. Obviously, yes, you want to be in position for lineups, but it's not just about lineups. And I think the way Ye can play the game, the way he can get into a comfort position actually works quite well with a Viper. What I don't agree on is the Flash Initiators. That seems to be a bit of a tougher project. But Zest coming in, does this fix it? No, not in my opinion, because Zest is a pure... Well, funny enough, Zest is a Viper main, or now he's a, a bit of a Viper main and also an Info Initiator main. So is there going to be a roll shuffle? I mean, even that, I, who knows? Who knows? There could be. I mean, maybe EA's back on Duelist. I don't know. Does he want to be back on Duelist? I don't know. So now this is the team where I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Meanwhile, Talon, I think, you know, Governor proved that uh, he can hang with the best. Now, obviously, the later matches outside of the opening match against Team Secret weren't as explosive. It was actually fairly quiet from the entire team. Uh, but it wasn't like they were getting absolutely crushed either. I think a lot of it was they were basically overheating quite a bit and as they were as their weaknesses were getting identified they couldn't like slow down enough to adapt to what the enemy was doing i'll also say that lenny seemed to have been very uh, very very prepared in terms of like how to play against secret in the opening match but the depth of his calling etc seemed to shake up a lot as the matches went on right so against drx and in the rematch against secret so while I was excited to see Lenny's calling look so good in the first match, basically it seemed like he was starting to run out of ideas and run out of steam a little bit and you couldn't catch up to the rest of it. So I'm not sure if they'll be stable enough to really be considered a strong team. I think Talon will continue to be part of the discussion for playoffs, but we'll see. Uh, also, obviously, Surf is on the roster. We don't know if he's playing on the starting roster. I'm going to assume not, but we'll have to wait and see for that as well. Uh, all things considered, though, while Talon, definitely some clear things to work on. I think just the baseline they have already is going to have an edge over Bleed. So we're going to give them the edge. T1 versus Paper X is next. And that is a rematch of the semifinals of the Pacific kickoff. Very close match at that point. I mean, 2-0, but the scoreline was fairly close. And uh, I think T1 showed, some, showed a lot of promise. However... Bad news for T1, Jing is back. Jing is back. He's not going to national service in Singapore. He can play. That's what they've announced. So he's back on the he's back on the active roster. Now we don't know if they breaks also what they're gonna do in their six-man roster either. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Right? The two like uh immovable teams of the RXs, right? DRX and Paper X. And they're now these two teams that everyone's like, ooh, like, what are you going to do with your six-man roster? Who knows? Here's the thing, is that I, just because Jing is back and Jing's raise is back in the discussion doesn't exactly fix the potential meta problems that PaperX was still trying to figure out, right? I, I mean, I'm not going to say that their comps and everything were bad, but at Masters Madrid, because they had to keep playing matches because they kept eventually winning and getting through the tournament, they had to revert to a lot of their old comps just out of comfort, it felt. Uh, and they weren't... It was very clear that they haven't really figured out how they want to define this current meta for themselves. So does Jing single-handedly fix that? No, not in my opinion. At that point... I mean, are they also going to play musical chairs, right? Like, if it's a race-specific map still, then... You know, and you want to play Duelist, and sure, Jin comes back in. That makes sense. Although, granted, I will I will just take this chance to say that Magnet really regained his confidence, I think, as Madrid went on, and he put up some great performances. Um, but sure, if it's the Rays, like, Jin comes back in. But, you know, if it's not the Rays, or if it's, like, a, a double Duelist with a Jet and something else, like, is it going to be the... Is it going to be Magnet uh, coming in to assist with that, uh, you know, is something still going to be the main jet? Like I, there's a lot of these questions, right? Obviously they're all very talented, which is why you have these question marks, but who knows what's going to happen. Meanwhile, T1, they didn't, they didn't make it to masters Madrid. So they've had a lot of time to figure out what else they want to do. I think they might be still slightly too stubborn on some of the ideas they have, but overall some, Lots of like individual creative work that was allowing this team to become very, very fluid and adaptive in the mid-rounding. 
which I think is very valuable in the current state of VCT. So I still rate T1 very highly. I, I mean, this match, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Because before the before the Jing news, I think I would have just said, I think I would have just easily said T1. I'm still going to just go with T1. I'm still going to go with T1. Because, I again, I, I don't know if Jing coming in single-handedly fixes that. I think this is going to be... A typical case of Paper Rex just needs some time to cook. They're going to need some time to cook. Now, I, I know I said that for kickoff. I said that for Masters Madrid. And what ended up happening was they, they like, stopped cooking. And their ingredients were just still so much fresher that they were able to get third place uh, at a Masters event. And I'm not taking that away from them. But I think they want to cook, right? Because you now have to look long term. You have to look long term if you want to get all the way to champions and try to win a, a champion's trophy. So... I think Paper X is going to want to cook. They're going to try to cook, and it's going to be a little shaky. And I think T1 now has that experience and had the time to really hone some of the weaknesses they had to come in and match Paper X and finally overcome them. I think T1 is a fluid enough team to do it. They just can't really fold at the at the last, you know, the last stretch. And I think this time off is what they would have needed. I think their ideas are going to be able to continue to match up against Paper X. It's just, do you lose steam or not in terms of the individual performances? And I'm going to, I'm going to give this edge to T1. Moving through. So we already talked a little bit about Team Secret. I think they're going to be a pretty strong team. I think they'll be a part of the discussion for sure on whether you can make it to a Masters event or not. I don't think they're, I think they're going to be fighting for that discussion. I don't think they're like in the discussion, but I think Team Secret will be fighting for it. RRQ. <laughs> As the uh, as the resident of VCT Pacific RRQ super fan, uh, I I don't know how I came to this. I still have faith in this roster. I still have faith in this team. But it's funny because a lot of people look back at the results and they say, "Well, RRQ only got to play Gen G twice, so maybe they really are better than everyone thought. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Chober was onto something. Maybe William was onto something. Like that's all the discussion that's been going around on RRQ. Quite frankly." Genji was an entirely different team from the beginning of kickoff through the end of Masters. Okay? Like, they were on the fast track level up pass, right? And they just leveled up every round they played. And they played a lot of those. So, I don't know if you can retroactively look at it and say, ooh, RQ might be like a top two, top three team. I don't think that's the reason to say that. I think RQ still has a bit of their own identity crisis as well. And I think a big part of this comes from the mid-rounding, and a big part of that might be language barrier. Is that something that can be fixed in a month? I have no idea. I have no idea. But it just seems like sometimes they they want to play like super aggressive. Some individuals want to play super aggressive to try to throw a curveball or try to match the opponents. And it just seems like at times the entire team isn't exactly on the same page. I think they proved against Gen.G, while again, Gen.G upgraded every match they played, I think they proved against Gen.G that individually, like at their peak, they can all match the best players, right? Because Gen.G, I think, absolutely proved they are some of the best players in the world individually. So I think RQ is able to do that at their peak, right? Not as consistently as, as Gen.G, well, or at least not yet proven. But I think they can do that at their peak. But the question is, is can you get on the same page enough that you can reach close to that peak as often as possible? And at kickoff, that didn't happen. And I think that's exactly what we saw from the 2-1 score lines, right? Is that like, ooh, it was close, it was close, it was close until at the end of the day, it wasn't. And then it was close again, and it wasn't, right? And this seems to be kind of the trend with RRQ versus Gen G. I still have a lot of hope for RRQ. I really do. And not just because of, <laughs> it's not because I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. I actually really do. Like individually, I think they're very talented. I think uh, even at kickoff, the things we saw them try to do, I think were, they had good ideas. The way they were adjusting from, from certain parts of the game into the next, it seemed good. But it seems now the, the missing the last 2%, the last 5% is consistent enough that I basically have to put up my hands and say, I don't know. I don't know if that's something that can be fixed in a month. I don't know if that's something that can be fixed in a year. It, it is something that could just not be fixed because maybe the parts aren't the right parts in chemistry. Like, who knows? I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm calling for a roster change, but this is only something the coaches and the players can identify. And what we have to do is wait and see. With all that said, 
I'm gonna vote for RQ. And again, this isn't this isn't just because of my RQ hype train. Um, I am going to say RQ because I think Jemkin still able to match Jeremy. I think Jemkin's gonna be able to do that as much as Jeremy was firing on all cylinders. And I think um the I actually think the core of RQ is still gonna be able to perform quite well. Like I think Flip still again showed some highlight moments and then like he was very up and down. So that I again part of it I think comes down to like the calling. Are you guys all on the same page or not? So assuming that they've worked on that, which I can't imagine why they wouldn't, then I think Flip should become more stable. That alone should allow Xfero to become way more stable, in my opinion. Uh so I think that those are gonna be some big parts. As long as RQ doesn't overheat. As long as RQ doesn't overheat. Because Secret, I don't think, will overheat against RQ. The other thing is, is, again, Secret, they've always played to their opponent's level. So if they think, like, RQ is close, but we're still above them, then I think they're going to play a little bit more, like, one-dimensional, simple Valorant, and RQ might surprise them. Quite, I basically rate Team Secret and RQ in the same exact tier uh, for each other, but I would say Team Secret is one where I'm like, ooh, I think they will confidently be fighting to be included in the discussion uh for an international event whereas rq i'm thinking in theory i can actually see them going to an international event but they haven't proven it yet so jury's out next up global versus drx we already talked about both teams as much as i've talked about how much drx is going to be shaky we're going to give it to drx over ge I don't think I have to expand on this too much but basically I think individually they're still going to be much stronger than GE so that should get through now Gen G versus Talon Esports the last team that or not the last team actually there's DFM waiting for us but Gen G another team we didn't get to talk about yet but again not too much to be said they performed exceptionally well at Masters Madrid they were the first Korean team to ever reach a grand finals of a Masters or a Champions event so that alone I think is an excellent milestone Yes, it feels bad because they were so close to winning, right? They were so close to winning the grand finals. So that's why it feels bad. But at the end of the day, Sentinels was the better team. I You cannot take that away from them. Gen G, like it's the lack of experience. It's this and that. But everything combined, they didn't have what it takes to grind out the best of five. They started to kind of shake up under the pressure. You could see that in their aim. their com Like you could see that their comms are starting to get messier. You could see that their aim was starting to get shakier. And Sentinels just did not fold, right? So I think on that day, Sentinels was absolutely the better uh, team. I think they were the absolutely the better team overall in Masters because of that growth. However, if we are to take what Genji said during kickoff and what Sentinel said at Masters Madrid to heart in terms of that experience helped us grow, this should be an absolute huge growth spurt for Genji. Coming in from an international event, I don't think you you can really... Um, discount the experience you gain from that and how much growth you can have. Like that is an experience that so many of these other teams in Pacific are not going to have. And you're just coming off fresh off of that experience. The, the only small little caveat that's pulling at the back of my heart is, um, you know, 2023 Gen G also had a great start. And then uh, they inexplicably fell apart. So... <laughs> Like that's, that's the only thing I'm like, Ooh, I don't know. It's happened before, but again, very different roster from everything we've seen on stage at the interviews at masters of Madrid and their own vlogs, things like that. The atmosphere on the current gen G seems a lot more stable. It seems a lot sturdier. Uh, if you look at their vlog, their behind the scenes vlog of kickoff as well. Like there's a scene where like Lakia is actually visibly like frustrated and just mad at himself at how he played. Uh, and like coach HSK is trying to just comfort him. He's like, it's okay. You know, you'll win the next one. And Lockheed is like slamming the table. Cause he like, he just doesn't know how to let it out. But HSK is still like, no, it's fine. He's like still comforting him. So it seems like they, they have a pretty good environment where you can vent out if you need to, and then you're still able to get back together. So again, as long as that doesn't fall apart, they should have grown a lot more. And individually, they've also proven that, you know, aim and mechanics, they're all top notch. Uh, the overall, uh, the teamwork seems still really good until the very last map of Icebox uh, on, at Masters Madrid. So overall, 
I think Genji will continue to be uh, one of the favorites, right? Kind of alongside Paper X, depending on, again, how quickly Paper X can figure out their current situation with the meta and the roster. So, Genji. Last but not least, T1 versus DFM. Or, I mean, maybe at least, because DFM still doesn't have a win. <laughs> However, um, I do think I do think DFM is going to get a win this year. I do think so. I mean, they played okay against DRX. Granted, they looked really bad afterwards. They looked pretty pretty horrendous against uh, Team Secret. But DFM on paper should be looking better. Should be looking better. And I talked about it in my Clove video. This is another team that, like, could be trying to use the clove maybe that works out for them maybe it doesn't one of the issues for this team is again they also tend to overheat a little bit um and if they can reel that back i think they'll they'll definitely get a win in my opinion in 2024 but it's not going to be against t1 however you should keep your eye on may if you are not convinced yet because everyone that's followed japan has always talked about how may is the next star to be looking at for japan he definitely put up performances despite the team's overall results at kickoff and I think he'll continue to do the same at stage one. It's just that their opening match is against T1. So these are my week one pickems: Zeta, Secret, Talon, T1, RQ, DRX, Genji, G... Oh, whoa. Why did I click on T1? <laughs> wow. No, I meant T1. Let's modify that. Glad, glad, I, glad I caught that. Okay, so while not every team is playing twice in the first week, uh, T1 will be, and I'm guessing that they are going to go 2-0. Really comes down to this Paper X match. But otherwise, everyone just sharing the championship points one at a time, and we'll have to wait and see how things go. So just based on everything I've said now, let's go ahead and try the week two, three, and four uh, pickems, and then we'll review these and, and modify them every week. Oh, right off the bat in week two, just a bet. What a day! April 13th, mark your calendars. I mean, watch it this weekend, but April 13th, Gen G versus Paper X and then T1 versus DRX. This is nasty. I'm going to go for Gen G though. And I'm going to go for T1. Oh man, if this happens, that is, that's a day to be a DRX fan, quite frankly. All right, moving on. Uh, Secret, RQ. I think these are pretty fairly straightforward. I mean, this is the one that I think could pretty change pretty easily. This one and maybe T1. I guess I guess the first day as well. But anyway, uh, Genji, DFM, Genji should win. Oh, this, I mean, for now, talent for sure. But this is another one that has potential to change based on their week one performances. T1 versus RQ. Okay, since we have the chance to modify this, I'm going to go for RQ. I'm going to let the hopium ride, baby. And then Zeta versus Bleed. Has a chance to change based on Bleed's performance, but we'll go with that. <laughs> and then it's Gen G versus DRX. Oh, it just doesn't stop, does it? I think Gen G wins again. Bleed versus DFM. I mean, individually, you should be voting for Bleed, but again, until Bleed proves me otherwise, I'm actually going to vote for DFM here. I'm going to vote for RQ. This one, I could get interesting. I'll vote for Paper X for now, but we'll see. T1 versus Talon could also get... I think this could be fun. I think T1 has the edge. Uh, but otherwise, pretty straightforward. Bleed versus Paper X. Paper X wins. I think DFM can, can beat GE. T1 versus Zeta. T1 wins. Team Secret versus Talon. The rematch. Oh, it's so late. But at that point, Team Secret has so much tape on Talon. So I think you have to give them that edge. Dude, this is the time. RQ. They finally have another shot. All right. So again, weeks two through four, we'll review as the weeks go by each time, and we'll modify our expectations versus what we saw in the previous week. But again, for week one, these are my pickems. Now let's talk about how does this reflect on the preseason tier list that we had before Pacific Kickoff happened. This is what we had uh, on December 28th of 2023. Uh, so this was, I believe, before we got to finally see Team Secret in action, although that was very, you know, that was a very short event for the offseason event. We had never seen RQ. Uh, and this was our ranking. And this was in relative order, right? So I rated Paper X T1, uh, then our, like this order, and Shin Chi was, uh, oh man, this, this came back to bite me, didn't it? Uh, and then the rest. So how have things changed? Now listen, I was a doubter of Gen G. I just didn't think they could make it come together um, in time for kickoff. 
I also listen. I I will I will live with the consequences. I doubted head coach Solo. I didn't think that he had proved himself enough in Challengers Korea to really come in and come out swinging. And boy, did he swing because it was a home run because they set a new record for Korean teams. So clearly, uh, Gen G, they didn't need to cook. They came out with with just an absolute five course meal for Pacific. So Gen G is going to move up. I think for now they are they are absolutely at at the top uh, for stage one and kind of moving forward. Let's talk about some of the other ones. Paper Rex. Well, with with Jin coming in, I think they're still going to be like at, at, in the discussion for solidly going to champions, you know, one way or another. So I think that's there. I I want to. This is. I'm going to hold out hope for T1. I still think they showed us enough at kickoff that they can build upon it. So we're going to go with T1 there. Now, R Q. First of all, let's move them back there for now. Team Secret, I think, solidly continues to be like at the top of the next tier. I really think so. I think Jeremy and Envy are, are going to continue to really drive home that secrets secret should be discussed more uh, by a lot of fans. So, I think Secret's going to be solidly in here. DRX, I think, solidly still behind Secret for me. Especially with the six-man musical chair thing going on. Zayn and Division looks like they need a little bit more time to cook. Right? Um, they look like they need a little bit more time to cook. And Bleed... I mean, they definitely need to cook, but we don't even know what their ingredients really look like. So we're going to move them back down here. Um, <laughs> this is just my... This is a slightly personal bias... Uh, on both teams, but we're going to put RQ in front. Let's just give him a slight edge. Outside of that, I think Talon actually came out swinging. I don't, I'm not confident enough to put them like here. If I did, they would be at the very end, but we're going to put them at like the needs to cook just a bit more category. Now I know they, they smashed secret, but secret that day, just they were a different team. Like, I don't know who was playing on that stage, man, in the opening match. And I'm not trying to take the win away from Talon. I think the win proved to us a lot of things. But it's not enough for me to be like, dude, they can't. Pop they have to be in the same tier. Not enough for that. Uh, and then GEDFM. So Bleed, we just put back down here. No, I can't in good conscience move. No, but I I think they're gonna get a win. So if I'm if I if I'm pretty confident they're gonna get a win, I guess they have to escape the might get a win category. So all right, pretty straightforward. I think this is this is my new this is my new ranking. This is my new ranking. In which case it actually works out quite well, right? So the three teams that I think are going to champions by the end of the year that will continue to be at the top, right? One way or another, whether it's through the points or through top three at stage two, after stage one is going to be Gen G, Paper X, T1, and then one of these teams will be the fourth team that takes the slot to go to champions. Um, and then these guys, I think, need a little bit... I mean, Talon really should be here, but just for the sake of evening out the tiers, we'll put Talon in the needs to cook. Both the Japanese teams, I think, still have to kind of figure out their identity and their flow a little bit. And GE and Bleed, man. I mean, prove me wrong. Again, like Gen G proved me wrong, and I'm very happy for it. So I would love for you to prove me wrong, but for now I have seen nothing that tells me that you shouldn't you should be above anybody else. Unfortunately. I mean listen, some some team has to be at the bottom, right? So this isn't anything like specifically against any teams. You're still in VCT Pacific. That still is a big deal. Uh, but you gotta prove me otherwise. Okay. Uh I mean, as, as much as I thought, that took a little bit, but there we have it. Those are my pickems for week one and kind of my overview on each team on what to expect going into stage one. Uh, and then we did a quick little kind of tier list adjustment compared to our old one. So basically the big change here is Gen G moving up all the way to the top. Uh, and outside of that, not too many changes. I think I'm kind of rating secret a bit higher now than RQ uh, and things like that, but Oh, I guess Talon, actually. Talon's a pretty big change because I had them very near the bottom. So, so all right. We had a bit of a shakeup in, in Pacific after kickoff and, of course, after Masters Madrid as well. We'll see. We'll see. Are there any more bigger changes? Are our teams going to surprise us like Gen G did? 
I'd be very pleasantly surprised. Well, these are my thoughts. Let me know what yours are down below. Feel free to link your pickums as well. Check them out. We'll see how everyone's doing. And we'll get to see who really comes out on top at VCT Pacific. Again, VCT Pacific kicks off on April 6th at 5 p.m. KST. Uh, I will actually be co-streaming the first two days because I'm not on the official broadcast. So you'll be able to catch the matches here on my channel and on Twitch as well. And then the other days, I will most for most of the days, I'll be on the official broadcast. So you can catch me on the main stream casting and being on the analyst desk. That's it for now, though. Let me know who you think is the team to look out for in VCT Pacific State. Stage one down in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and a comment, even a short one. I'd really appreciate it. That helps a lot for both the channel and myself to kind of see what you guys are enjoying. And of course, if you're new, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. That's it. We'll be back next week for week two's pickums of VCT Pacific.